Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Grace Online. We're so glad that you have uh, joined us here for a time of uh, spending time in His Word, in the Lord's Word. And I just want to say to you and to your family, um, Happy New Year! You made it! Uh, 2021 has finally arrived, and uh, we thank God for His faithfulness in seeing us through 2020 and everything that uh, was involved there. But we are believing that 2021 is going to be a year where we experience more of God's goodness, more of God's grace for whatever is ahead of us. We don't know what's coming this year, but what we do know is that God's grace, his power, his love, praise God, his presence is going to be with you. It's going to be with me uh, no matter what uh, 2021 has in store. And so we just uh, thank God for his faithfulness and with great expectation and faith, uh, we look forward to what he has for us in this new year. So uh, we're going to begin this morning uh, by looking into his word for a few moments together. Uh, but in preparation for that, would you just join me in a word of prayer to our Lord? Gracious Father, we thank you for the uh, faithfulness that you have demonstrated to us in bringing us to this, uh, the very first Sunday of 2021. Lord, we just give you the glory and the praise, Lord, for uh, this opportunity that we have to start anew and to start afresh. Lord, to draw closer to you, Lord God, and to fulfill your purpose and your mission in our lives and through our lives. And so we want to begin just by giving you the very first Sunday of this new year. We open up our hearts to you and we ask God that you would speak to us, that you would challenge us. Lord, that you would rearrange, Lord God, those things in us, Lord God, to be more closely aligned with your purpose and your will. So I ask for all of my friends that have joined us here this morning that you would be with them wherever they are, in, in their car, uh, as they're out on their walk, in their living room, out on uh, Lord, the kitchen, wherever they are. May your presence fill that space where they are and may your word have its uh, impact upon each of our lives. And we'll give you the glory and the praise for it all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. So glad to have you with us this, this morning. Uh, we do uh, want to spend a few moments here looking into God's word uh, together. Because here at the beginning of the year, we're in that period uh, or that season in the new year where uh, traditionally we review our lives and we begin to look into those areas of our lives where we would like to do better or we'd like to be better in some area of our life. And so in order to do that, we make resolutions or we make promises to ourselves in order that we might accomplish uh, those improvements. We say things like, uh, this year I want to get in shape. This is the year that I want to uh, quit smoking or quit drinking. This is the year that I want to improve my relationships with my family or with my coworkers. This is the year that I want to improve my financial situations. Those are some of the goals that we set. And, and so as good as those desires are, and, and they are good, we know that just wanting those things, just wanting those accomplishments to happen is not enough in order to see them fulfilled. There's a lot of factors that play into whether or not we actually experience uh, the fulfillment of those goals and, and, and attain those things. Uh, perhaps the most important or certainly not the least of those factors is the factor of making a choice. We have to make choices that lead us to those goals. Isn't that right? They don't just happen, but we have to make choices. If we want to get in shape, then we have to make the choice. Come on, somebody say with me, the choice. Somebody, We have to make the choice uh, to change our diet perhaps and eat healthier and spend time being active and exercise and not in inactive. That's a choice. If we want to uh, stop smoking or drinking, then we have to make a choice to choose different ways, more productive or constructive ways of dealing with our stress or, or our anxiety. We have to develop positive habits instead of those things that we know are self-defeating and self-destructing. If we want to improve our relationships, then we have to choose to relate to people in a different way, in a brand new way. There might be some people that we actually need to forgive or, or to release uh, from the, the debt that we believe that they owe us in order to start and to begin a brand new quality of relationship with them. 
uh, if we want to improve our financial situation. Come on, some of us need to do something new and create a budget. <laughs> some of us need to stop some of the impulse spending and be more disciplined in that area of life. All of that is just to say that it is great to have good and noble goals and desires, but those things do not happen without making the choices that lead us to those goals. And so um, there's a popular maxim that I'm sure is not new to, to most of you, and it's this, that the choices you make in turn make you. Isn't that true? The choices you and I make, they turn around and over a period of time, they begin to shape us and make us and shape the direction that we are going to take. And so in this new year, I really do hope that you are able to make those choices that lead you to success in those areas where you are wanting to improve and to make changes. I really want that for you in this new year. But none of those choices, in fact, even none of any of those accomplishments, none of those accomplishments, should we achieve them, ultimately matter in comparison to the choice that Jesus is calling you to and he's calling me to in this new year of 2021. I mean, it'll be great if we can get in shape and, and maybe lose some weight. It'll be great if we can strengthen our financial standing and have better relationships. Those are wonderful things, but those choices pale in comparison to the choice that Jesus is calling you and I to in this brand new year. In fact, that truth that the choices you make in turn make you finds not just a temporal expression, but it finds an eternal expression in the words of Jesus that we're going to look at this morning. If you have your Bible, would you join me by turning to Matthew chapter number seven, Matthew chapter number seven and verse number 13 is what we're going to look at this morning. Matthew chapter seven, and verse 13. Uh, grab your Bible or your iPad or uh, your mobile device, whatever you have. Open up your Bible app, and I'd like you to read these words with me from Jesus. Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 13. It says this. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Oh, there's the choice that we have to make in order to improve our health. There are the choices that we have to make in order to improve our relationships or to get free from addictions or habits. The choices that we have to make in order to improve our financial situation. But Jesus presents us with a choice in these words that has the power to direct our future destiny for eternity. The choice that Jesus lays before us has that power. It shapes us eternally, not just during this earthly life. As we're looking at these verses here in chapter 7, verse number 13, this is the conclusion of uh, one of the most well-known and, and uh, popular sermons that Jesus ever preached called the Sermon on the Mount. It's a sermon that begins all the way back in chapter number 5 and continues to the very conclusion of chapter 7. And during his sermon, uh, Jesus just meticulously and, and powerfully dismantles the, the validity of an external-based religion. An external uh, works approach to trying to have right relationship with God. He completely just explodes it and dismantles it. And then along with that, he also presents the power. He presents the authenticity of true relationship with God that those who are citizens of the heavenly kingdom of our heavenly father really demonstrate and what they express. How the character and the quality of our devotion to God what it looks like for those that are true citizens of the kingdom, that it is not external in its orientation, but it is internal. It is not something that is done for the eyes of men, but it is done for the eyes of God. That is the type of and the quality, the character of our devotion to God that those who are citizens, true citizens of the kingdom possess. 
And so Jesus, after this powerful uh, sermon from chapter 5 all the way through chapter 7, in this section, he begins that crucial point in his sermon where he begins to call his audience, he calls his hearers to a choice. He calls them to a decision to be true citizens of this kingdom and how that's going to happen. Listen, everybody wants to go to heaven. But not everybody wants to make the choice that leads there. Let me say that again. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but not everybody makes the choice that leads there. And Jesus wants to make sure that you have the opportunity and that I have the opportunity to make the right choice, the call to choose the, the right way. So there's a couple observations that I just want to give you for a, a few moments as we're looking at this passage here in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 13. A few things that Jesus uh, puts before us if we're going to reach that final destination of heaven that we all want. The first one that I see here in this verse is he, Jesus tells us that there is a choice to make. Jesus tells us there is a choice to make. Notice in these verses, verses 13 and 14, he says, enter through the narrow gate. He says, because broad is the road and wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Jesus is here presenting, is presenting us with a, a variety of different contrasts in just these two verses. Several different contrasts. There's a different road and there are, there are different disciples or different crowds and there's a different end. But he begins here by presenting two different gates, by contrasting two different gates. And he's using this image of the two gates to describe receiving salvation and entering in to the kingdom of heaven. He's using these two gates as means for pursuing those two things, pursuing salvation and entering into heaven. And I just want to say just right off the beginning, just looking at that idea, that tells us, listen, that the beginning matters. The way you start something, it's important. It's, it matters. Isn't that right? Boy, if you are going out on a date with somebody that you really like or that maybe you hope to spend your life with, you know that you, uh, you shower up real good so you smell good. You put on a pair of uh, an outfit that you know you look good in, right? You try to do everything you can in order to make a good first impression. Why? Because the way you start matters. And it has consequences. It has an effect for the way things continue thereafter. If you're looking for a, a good job, you don't just throw anything together as your resume and send it over to them. No, you make it look sharp. You, look at, you make it look professional. You make sure the words are spelled correctly that it's easy to read and that it looks good and impressive. Why? Because the way you start something matters. And when it comes to salvation, Jesus is making that point. The way you start out trying to pursue the goal of finding heaven and receiving his salvation, it matters. And from the very beginning, Jesus wants you and I to enter into the right gate because there's two gates that claim to lead toward eternal life, but only one of them really does. And Jesus wants us to make it through the right gate. And so there is a choice to make. It's very important. It's very important uh, among this list of uh, contrasts that Jesus gives here in these verses that he begins with the contrast between the two gates. Uh, it's, it's perhaps the most important of all the contrasts why is that? Listen, why is it important? Because the choice that you make here determines what you experience or the side of the other contrasts that you experience later. Said another way, the way you approach trying to find your way to heaven, trying to receive the salvation of God is going to, is going to impact the way you continue and pursue that goal. Let me say it this way. The gate you enter determines the road that you're on. <laughs> the gate that, you're, that you enter determines the road that you're on. And the road that you're on determines the crowd that you join. And it also determines, ultimately, the destiny or the destination that you reach. 
So uh, there's much that can be said about this, these two gates. Uh, but the element that I just want to draw your attention to first is the element of choice. We have to choose the narrow gate. We have to choose the gate that Jesus says leads to salvation and avoid the gate of our own making. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, it tells us, there is a way that seems right to a man, that looks good. It appears to lead to heaven, but the proverb says the end of that way is death. And so we have to accept Jesus' word that it is the narrow gate that leads to heaven. And the one that is wide is the one that leads to destruction. I don't know who it is that may be challenging you not to believe that there is a narrow gate, that there's only one way, that Jesus is the only means of salvation. It might be a university professor that told you that's too restrictive or that can't be right. There's several ways to God that, that it, it's, it's too uh, restrictive to think that there's only one way. It might be... Uh, you know, a agnostic or an atheistic friend that you have or somebody that has not had any exposure to Christian teaching. But as far as I'm concerned, I'll take Jesus's word over a university professor. Come on, somebody. I'll take Jesus's word for what it takes to make it into heaven over a friend of mine who's turned their back upon God. We have a choice to make. That means that we can't blame somebody else for why we don't make it to heaven. We can't just assume that we're going to get there because our parents or our family were Christians. We have a deliberate choice to make to enter into that narrow gate, that way that approaches God with a sense of brokenness and poverty of soul as Jesus talks about in his sermon in chapter 5. That we come to him and say that I have nothing to offer. I'm bankrupt in and of myself. I am releasing control of my life to you that I might find your salvation. We have to make that choice. You see, I was a believer, or I believed in, I should say, the truths of the gospel growing up in a Christian family. And I had grown up hearing the gospel preached and taught and as I was a teenager, I believed that it was all true. But had I died in my early teenage years, I would have not gone to heaven. Why? Because even though I did not, even though I did believe the truth of the gospel, and I believed that Jesus was the Son of God, I believed that He was the Savior of the world, I had never made the choice to enter into that narrow gate. Oh, I understood the narrow gate. I admired the narrow gate. I knew that the, right, the, the, the narrow gate was the right way, but I had never made a choice to actively enter in, to turn my life over to Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, turning your life over to him is the very beginning. Releasing your life to his lordship is the beginning of entering in to that new life. Matthew chapter, uh, John, uh, John chapter 1 verse 12 it says, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. Listen, we have to actively choose and receive Jesus as Lord. And I just hope that in this upcoming year, as you and I are faced with a multitude of choices along the way this year, that each time we will choose that way that is pleasing to God. We'll choose the way that's not easy, maybe not popular, maybe not even comfortable with what we want to do, but we will choose the way that is pleasing to God in the, how, in the way we talk, in the way we think, in the way we respond to people around us, in the goals that we pursue, that God will enable you and I this new year to make a choice to honor him and to enter in to the narrow gate. I see in these verses... Secondly, not only a choice to make, but I also see a cost to pay. A cost to pay. Do you see that in the verses? It says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate 
and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Jesus talks about a narrow gate. He talks about a, 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 a small path, a small gate to get through. And what is, the, what is the point of that? He is saying that we cannot bring in all of our pride and all of our, all of our uh, sin and all of our own self-righteousness into the kingdom. We've got to release that to him. We've got to release it to him in order to enter in to that narrow gate. There is a cost to following Jesus. There is a restricting, there is a, a confining element that we have to let go of the things that we held on to and release them to him. You know, we had uh, our family over, uh, uh, just our immediate family <laughs> for uh, Christmas this year, Christmas dinner. And we pulled out uh, the leaf to the table and we were all sitting around the table. And there's a side to our dinner table that whenever you want to leave the dinner table and move towards the kitchen, when people are seated there, there's not room to pass. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. There's not room between the chair and the wall. And in order to get, in order to get through that area to the kitchen, listen, you've got to turn. Or I should say it this way. I have to turn. <laughs> I have to turn. And I have to go sideways to that section. And I even need a little help by asking that person who's seated in that impasse to please scoot up a little bit. Scoot up so I can get through. And most of the time, they're willing to do that. But can I tell you, when it comes to entering into heaven and receiving his salvation, the gate is narrow. And God is not making more room. He looks to us. He calls us to let go of control of our own lives and surrender it to him. To let go of all of our self-righteousness and all of the things that we present before God as the reason why he should accept us. Jesus says the gate is too narrow to bring all of that. You've got to come empty, broken, and, and alone just you. Just you in your heart. Bring that to me. Then you can come through the gate. Then you can walk on the road that is narrow. It's difficult to do. Difficult to do. Paul described that process in his own life in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 4. He said this, If anyone thinks that he has reason to put confidence in his flesh, that is confidence in his own moral goodness, Paul says, I have more. And he goes down the list of his religious credentials that would make him acceptable before God. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. But whatever was to my profit, listen, whatever was to my profit and to my gain, Paul says, I now consider a loss. I let go of it. I abandon it. I cut the ties on it. Why, Paul? For the sake of Christ. I abandon my self-righteousness. I abandon my religious credentials. I abandon the sense that I'm in control of my own life and I can make it on my own. I abandon all that and in my poverty, in my brokenness, I turn to Christ. Listen, that's what we need to do. We have to pay the price, pay the cost of letting go of not only our self-righteousness, but anything in this world that would keep us from following the Savior. This is the year that he's calling us to pay the cost, to let it go, to enter the narrow gate, to walk on the narrow road. He's calling us to do that in 2021. And it may cost us something different for each one of us. Listen, it's got to cost us something. There's nobody following Jesus that does so without a cost. For some of us who are following Jesus, it might cost you an opportunity to move up and prom be promoted in advance in your company. 
Because you're not willing to shade the books. You're not willing to do things on business trips that you know would be displeasing to God and cause um, a, you know, a, a disgrace to your integrity. And because of that, you don't, you, you don't advance. You can consider that just the cost to pay to follow Jesus and enter the narrow gate. For others, it might cost you the respect of those who have no regard and do not value your commitment to Jesus. And to stand up for him might cost you their friendship. It might cost you their respect. That's okay. Enter into the narrow gate, my friend. For others, it might cost you just the, some of the comforts that this world offers. But whatever it costs us, just recognize those are things that we willingly leave behind in order to enter into the narrow gate to receive his salvation and be on the road that leads to eternal life. For those of us that, that it's already costing you something, I just want to remind you that the world may be promising you fulfillment and joy and peace, but listen, they do not fulfill their promise. Those that try to find their satisfaction and try to find their identity and try to find their purpose in the things of this life, if they are able to reach those things, at the end of that, they discover that they are empty, that they do not ultimately fulfill. And they're certainly not the means that lead to heaven. Come on. The world promises less than it really delivers. But Jesus is the one who gives you more than you're paid, more than you pay for. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, we all like a we all like a good deal, isn't that right? We all like a discount. And Jesus says, whatever you've got to give up in order to get through that narrow gate to receive my salvation and put aside all other religions, all other philosophies, all other pursuits of pleasure, whatever you have to leave behind in order to enter the gate to be in fellowship with me, listen, you're going to receive far more than you ever let go of. Hallelujah. Amen. You're going to receive far more. Jesus always gives you more than you pay for. Amen. Praise God. I'll just let you know that it's costing believers around this planet right now some of them their lives some of them are laying their lives down in order to enter that narrow gate and to stay true to the name of Jesus that doesn't minimize what it's costing you or what it's costing me but we ought to be thankful we ought to be grateful that that's all that he's requiring of us and at least at this point in our history it's not required us to lay down our life amen Truly, any cost that we pay far outweighs whatever we had to pay in order to receive a life of fellowship with Jesus. Far outweighs it. Jesus, or uh, Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, he said, I consider everything a loss. Everything is a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, and I consider them rubbish that I might gain Christ. Listen, my friend, whatever it takes for you and for me to know Jesus better in 2021, it's worth the price. If it costs us a little comfort, if it costs us maybe some relationships or some friends, maybe it might cost us some advancement or some pleasure. Listen, if it, whatever it costs us, it is well worth it that we might gain a deeper fellowship with Christ, that we might know that we are his and he is ours and that we are on our road, on our on the road to eternal life with him. It is well worth it. There's something interesting that I find in this verse, verse 14, it says that because the gate is small and the um, and the road is narrow that leads to life. He gives us a, a very sobering warning. He says, few find it. Few find it. That word few is one of the most disturbing words in the Bible to me. Few doesn't mean everybody. Few doesn't even mean most people. Few means very small numbers of those who think they're on their way to heaven are actually entered in through the narrow gate and are on the narrow road. Because the wide gate is easier. The wide gate has more people on it. The wide road has more, the wide road has more people on it. The wide way 
does it cost you in order to follow Jesus? The wide road allows you to use Jesus. In Mark chapter 4, there is a picture of Jesus as the sower who scatters the seed of the word of God that those who receive it enter into the kingdom of God. And there's a number there in counting the different types of soils that has always been sobering to me. And it is that there are four types of soil, right? There's the soil that's hard and on the path. There's the soil that is rocky. There's the soil that is uh, eaten up by weeds. And there's the soil that is fertile. And of those four types of soil, three of them, or 75% of them, if I'm doing my math right, produce nothing. I don't know if Jesus is trying to give us a specific number, but if he is, he is saying that only 25% or only one of four of those who are receiving the seed of God's word are actually bearing fruit with their life. I don't know about you, but I want to be one of the few that enter the narrow gate. I want to be one of the few that are walking on the road with others that are have entered through the narrow gate and have abandoned confidence in my own abilities and cling solely upon the merit of Jesus Christ for my salvation and my hope of eternal life in heaven. Jesus tells us in this call to choose that there's a choice to make and there's also a cost to pay. But finally, just as an encouragement, he also tells us in this text, he also tells us, verse number 14, that there is a consequence, and I'll just say there is a result, there is a conclusion to expect. Based on the gate that we enter in and the road that we walk on, there is a consequence that we can anticipate when we stand before our maker. Verse 14 says, broad is the road, listen, that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road, and here's the benefit, that leads to life. Come on, that's telling us that the, the decisions that you and I make here at the beginning of 2021 and throughout this year, the decisions that we make to make Jesus a priority over our own comfort, to make Jesus a priority and pleasing him above other people's approval or, or, or above our own promotion, those choices, Jesus says, they are leading us to a conclusion. They're leading us to a consequence. And if we are putting Jesus first, they lead us to eternal life. Praise God. Not because we've merited it, not because we've earned it, but because we have placed our faith in the one who has merited it for us. Hallelujah. We've not allowed other things to push Jesus out of the way, but we have kept him front and center. We've kept him our priority and our focus. And in 2021, that's what I want to do. I want to keep Jesus front and center. I want to choose him over Earl. I want to choose him over popularity. I want to choose him over comfort. I want to choose him over pleasing other people. I want to choose him over everything that I might stay on that narrow road. How about you? Because I know that there it, it leads to eternal life. It leads to eternal fellowship with him. Listen, when we get to heaven, whatever it costs us, we'll look back and we'll say, it was well worth what I gave up. It was well worth those who didn't understand. It was well worth uh, the experiences that I did not have or the places I did not go. It was well worth the sacrifices that I had to make to be in eternal fellowship with him who is our life. What about you? What about you? What about me? How are we going to respond to his call to enter into the narrow gate, to walk on the narrow road? You might be someone that today you've never responded to that call of entering into the narrow narrow gate. You've been walking on the road that was easy. You've been walking on the road of your own moral goodness, thinking that would be enough. After all, everybody else, it seems, is doing this. But this morning you realize that only through leaving behind your pride, leaving behind your own self-righteousness and moral standing in the eyes of people, 
and clinging to Christ can you enter into that road that truly leads to everlasting life. If that's you, I just want to spend the last few moments of our time here this morning leading you in a prayer that will express what it takes to enter into that narrow gate. Would you bow your head with me? If this is the desire of your heart to receive Christ as Savior and Lord and enter into that narrow gate, I want to encourage you to repeat this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that I've sinned against you. That my own moral goodness would never be enough to close the gap my sin has created in our relationship. But Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. You paid the price that I might be forgiven. So I leave behind my own good works. I leave behind my trust in trying to be a good person. And I put my faith in what you've done for me. I turn away from my sin and I turn to you as my Savior and my Lord. I ask you to wash my heart clean. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life that I might enter into that narrow gate that leads to everlasting life. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God for you, my friend. If you prayed that prayer, I am so excited for you. I celebrate with you. And I just want to invite you to uh, contact us and help uh, so that we can help you grow in your newfound faith in the Lord. You can reach us uh, on, on, through our email through our website at info at graceassembly.la and if you just send us a note say hey I prayed that prayer with pastor uh, over the internet and we would be glad to send you if you give us your contact information we will send you a little booklet that we call now what it's just uh, seven short lessons one week worth of studies to help you get into the word of God and establish a foundation for you in your new found faith with Jesus Christ and so we just we celebrate that that truth with you we celebrate that truth with you amen Praise God. And so, um, and just for all of our, all of our um, family, our Grace family, um, we love you and we're so appreciative of, of you being a part of us, even if it's, if it's remotely and virtually online. Um, and uh, we just uh, want to, to encourage you um, that we're, we are praying for you. We're believing God to see us all through this uh, season until we're able to come back uh, together physically. Um, we're all looking forward to that day. But in the meantime, we're going to be faithful to God through, through his word and in fellowship even through the means that he's given us. Amen? Amen. 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 I do want to also uh, ask those that are um, who so love and support the ministry of Grace Assembly uh, to go to our website. We, even though we are not meeting here physically at the building, um, how you know the bills keep coming to the building? <laughs> that, that continues to happen. And so uh, we just ask for your uh, ongoing faithfulness. Uh, in giving, you can go to our website, graceassembly.la. Uh, on the top right-hand corner, you can click on Give Online, and there's a very simple portal uh, for you just to uh, give your tithes or your, your offering or uh, your missions uh, gift, whatever uh, the Lord has put on your heart to contribute. Um, we greatly appreciate it. We, we uh, survive uh, because of the giving of God's people, and uh, we just, we're believing that God will just bless uh, each of those who, uh, who are following him. Uh, during this new year, especially those that are part of the Grace family. We believe that God is going to bless and, and take care of us all. Amen. Uh, until we're able to come back uh, together again. So as we look forward to this new year, uh, let me pray a final prayer with you. And, uh, and then we will go in to the new year 2021 uh, full of faith to see what God has for us. Amen. Father, thank you for my friends, my brothers and sisters that have gathered with us here um, virtually on, on uh, Grace Online. And I pray, Lord God, that beginning today, 
at the moment of decision, when we have to choose between um, our own comfort, uh, we have to choose between um, the allurements of the world, we have to choose between um, what our flesh would demand or what people would expect that would compete with you. Lord, help us every time to choose you, to enter into that gate that's going to lead to a deeper relationship with you, a greater fellowship, Lord, ultimately that leads us, Lord, on that road of eternal life. I pray that your grace and the power of your Holy Spirit will enable us to begin that process uh, today, Lord, in this week, Lord, so that um, next year, after uh, 52 weeks of 2021, we will love you better. We will reflect your character more, more clearly, Lord, and that we'll be closer to you. And uh, we just thank you for all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, my friends. I pray God's a blessing on you in this new week that he'll help you establish those brand new patterns that will lead you to a deeper growing relationship with Jesus. God bless you.